<clears throat> okay, we had been. Uh, what? We've been uh, going over uh, in the last episode, <laughs> we had uh, about a lot of things uh, and mostly about the generator and the safety of the, uh, safety of the generator. I'm getting echo from somebody. Uh, I'm not sure. So anyway, um, we'll continue on from there. Um, on RF safety, uh, some of the biggest things that can happen. Uh, there's a previous uh, slide. You don't want this to happen to you when you're out there trying to touch things and make them work. You don't want to be electrocuted. And it can happen. Uh, keep that from happening, fuses and so forth. But there's also a, a grounding uh, and all that that you need to uh, make sure that you don't get electrocuted. Um, <clears throat> we left off at slide this one. Uh, lightning protection, lightning's a big deal when you're dealing with antennas and uh, a storm. A lot of times we're out because of storms and you gotta know about our safety and, and the lightning and so forth. Uh, precautions should be taken when a lightning storm is around. Uh, first of all, you disconnect the antenna cables from the thing. And um, you also um, want to unplug all power cords from the AC outlets. Um, and how do we work at that? Well, we'll get into that. Stop using your radio equipment, move to another room until the storm passes. Uh, all these are the correct answers to this. Well, uh, fire prevention is the most important reason to have a lightning protection. Um, and there's lightning in you and you get off the air. These are the questions I would imagine here. RF safety. Um, Ensure that all stations comply with the FCC requirements for maximum permissible exposure to RF. That's the FCC's version of wear a mask. Um, in other words, don't stand next to the antenna or trampening, uh, whether you know it or not. You know, a lot of these new walkie talkies, handhelds, whatever you want to call them that come out, have some higher power to them. Like some of them are 10 Watts. Personally, I would not want to put a, an antenna with 10 watts at my frontal lobe. And I don't think anybody should. A lot of the, if, you, if your radio does not have an external microphone, get one um, and make sure you use it because that's, that's part of the RF safety protocol. <clears throat> don't cook your brain. Uh, make certain that the RF radiation is uh, confined to the antenna's radiating elements. Uh, don't operate high powered amplifiers with the covers removed. It's, it sounds like simple stuff, but I mean, a high powered linear amplifier on a, on a radio like we use, they have 3000 volts in there and they'll handle some decent current and you don't want to be touching them. Uh, the transmitters like I work on have as high as 30,000 volts and you definitely don't want to touch them. Uh, there's, they'll, they'll knock you across the room, but, um, uh, with a handheld transceiver, keep the antenna away from your head. Use the lowest power possible. Don't work on antennas that have RF power applied. In other words, don't be out there with somebody talking on the end and, and uh, working on the antenna. One of the things we used to do long ago when uh, people say, oh, wow, antenna on your car, what's that for? I said, well, touch it. it it'll tickle you. And then we talk with 100 watts and it would zap them because even though you have 100 watts the, the voltage out there on that antenna is pretty high so you don't want to be touching that uh, never look into a waveguide or directed uhf shf antenna when the power supplied uh uhf and waveguide um your microwave oven has a waveguide that powers the energy into the food and you all know what it does to that well the um that's a UHF antenna, a satellite. Now we, we have a number of these uh, systems set up in the area that are 
microwavable links uh, set up, don't, don't look in the, in the front of that. They'll cook your eyes and that's exactly what it'll do. You won't be seeing afterwards, so avoid that. You know, handheld radios are exempt from RF exposure lists. Minimum power should be used with a handheld radio to uh, minimize RF exposure to the operator's head and eyes. Absolutely. Uh, put that radio on your belt, hold it out away from you or something, get it away from you with your, um, wire, your wired in microphone and use it that way. A mobile transceiver with a roof mounted antenna would have better shielding for the vehicle occupants than using a handheld transceiver inside the vehicle. Besides that, an antenna on the outside will actually make that radio work. Having it inside, bad idea if you're trying to make contacts. Uh, equipment, leaving yours behind. Uh, you're exhausted, tired, and you're ready to head home, but the MCOM operation is far from over. You brought along a complete station. And when you leave, the next operator is not nearly as well equipped. So what do you do? Should you leave your equipment behind for the next operator? Uh, <clears throat> no one can or should tell you to leave your equipment behind. If you're, you know, keep in mind, if it breaks, nobody's gonna replace it for you. It's yours and you volunteered it. If you feel uncomfortable that someone you know and trust will look after your gear, then you may choose to leave it, but be sure every piece is marked with at least your name and call sign. Do not leave behind anything the next operator does not truly need. And you still have the for its operation and safety. It's a lot to leave on you when you're not there. Um, emergency stations are difficult places to control and monitor. There are people in and out all the time. And if your equipment is stolen, lost, damaged, you should not hold anyone responsible but yourself, as I said earlier. Conversely, if someone leaves their equipment in your care, treat it and protect it better than you would your own and make sure it's safely returned to the owner. And that's, that's the best way to put it. Make it, make sure you treat it better than you would your own and return it to the operator later. Uh, accepting specialized assignments. You may be asked to handle some other assignments for the served agency, you know, whether it's Pima, Dauphin County, or whomever it may be, uh, that may or may not include communicating. Uh, you know, they, they, they can have us do other things. At one time, most MCOM groups had strict policies against doing other tasks. And this is still true. Uh, today, most MCOM groups will permit their managers or their members to be cross-trained and perform a variety of served agency skills that also include communicating. But for me, I would never want even, even trained, I would not want to be responsible for giving CPR. If they are trained better, <clears throat> let them do it. It's uh, if that agency is, is what they do. I'm using it only as an example. Uh, they, they may say, hey, can you run this over to the next uh, uh, cubicle or, or station or whatever, or take this out to one of the other places in the, in the uh, war room? And you can do that if you, if you feel you can. Uh, if you're the, if you're the uh, standby operator waiting to go on, why not? It helps uh, improve some of the, uh, uh, it's, it's a good neighbor's kind of thing to do think that you're not just some kind of weird guy with a propeller in your head that only does communications. So, not that there's anything wrong with having a beanie with a propeller. Any questions from anybody or comments before we go on? <clears throat> okay. Now, if everybody knows what simplex is, that's direct communications from one radio to the other. To use a, an example, EB radios are simplex because there are no repeaters. Our handheld radios and two meters, anything we've got can be simplex and we get used to that on UHF, VHF and so forth. Of course on the shortwave bands or HF bands, it is all simplex because it's radio to radio. Which of the following will not limit VHF simplex range? Terrain, output power, antenna gain or digipeters? Digipeters? 
it doesn't even belong in this this discussion it's that but all the three will the terrain the output power of your radio and the antenna gain of your radio all affect it now i'm not sure what this means but my uh warning came up said my internet connection's unstable i hope you can all still see me and hear me which of the followings will not improve simplex operation <clears throat> Uh, and we look down over the line quickly, switch to a lower gain, non-directional, increased transmitter will not prove it. B, swing to a lower gain, non antenna will definitely not improve it or make it worse. Which of the following is true about a simplex repeater? We didn't uh, go into this a whole lot. Uh, a simplex repeater, uh, for those who don't get it, it will store and forward your communications. That's one way to put it. It's a recorder, usually digital. It'll record for about 20 seconds or until you let up on your, your microphone. And then it will uh, retransmit it exactly as it went into it. Why do you use them? You put them up in a high location and uh, where you can't reach across different uh, you know, mountaintops or whatever, and it's one way available to us to get a, a signal across. Often you plug them into a handheld radio and put it up somewhere. Uh, which of the following is true? The FCC rules do not permit unattended operation of simplex repeaters. They work best in the crossband repeater mode. That's a different thing. And they require the use of two radios is the same as a human repeater. Well, the FCC does not permit unattended operation of simplex repeaters. I wish I had mine to show you. It's about the size of a cigarette pack. And uh, <clears throat> it has a nine volt battery in it and a chip that records and it uh, has a connection to plug into one radio. Band repeaters uh, are a little different. They, they work without storing and forwarding, uh, but they're pretty good. And that's the kind that I like to use most. Which of the five means of dealing with a stress during an MCOM event? Oh, by the way, the repeater receives on UHF and broadcasts back out on VHF at exactly the same time as it's bringing it in. That's the difference between a simplex repeater and a crossband repeater. Uh, the following good means of dealing with stress during an MCOM event. The answer to that is uh, prioritize your actions, the most important and time sensitive ones come first. And uh, definitely not <clears throat> a bottle of vodka. Anyway, uh, any questions before starting topic number 22? Anybody? Okay. Now I need to go back to this. And. Topic 22. They did say 22, right? I believe so. There you go. Safety and survival. <clears throat> As everybody says, if it hits the fan, I'm taking care of my family first. That's what you do. That's really the intent. Before leaving on an assignment, make sure all necessary arrangements are made for the safety, security, and general well being of your home and family. Family members, perhaps friends and neighbors, should know where you're going, when you plan to return, and how to get a message to you in an emergency. Even if it's not one of them where, you know, we have to evacuate the whole place because the bomb's coming or something, but it's normal things that we do. Make sure that neighbors do know all of that because um, if something should happen and they need to find you, it's better that someone else in addition to your family knows how to find you. That's the whole idea. If you live in a disaster area or in a potential path of a storm, consider moving your family to a safe location before beginning your volunteer activities. And do, take whatever steps you can to protect your own property from damage and looting. 
let a neighbor or even local police know where you're going and when you plan to return and how to reach you and your family or your family and the members in an emergency. <clears throat> uh, create home and family checklists. You may want to, if it's a storm, like we had in Florida, you want to board up your windows if you're in the storm's path and around here too. Put lawn furniture and loose objects indoors if high winds are likely. Uh, more move valuables to upper levels of the f if flooring, if flooding is possible. Heating and fuel tanks should be filled, drain pipes if below freezing temperatures and power loss is possible. Um, shut off power and get to practice for damage as possible. <clears throat> uh, you don't want to come home to broken pipes. I've done that, it's not fun. Um, <clears throat> create home and family checklist. Uh, again, a safe families, a safe place to stay if needed, preferably with friends and relatives, uh, re reliable transportation with a fuel tank filled and not come home with an empty tank and expect that you'll get it later because if you know the storm's coming, you may not be able to get gas. Adequate cash <clears throat> money or for regular needs and emergencies, not ATM and credit cards. House auto life health insurance information, take it along if you're evacuated. Uh, get access to important legal documents such as wills and property deeds and so forth and emergency food and water supply. That's really important. You got to eat or you can't do anything. An AM FM radio with extra batteries. Uh, they, that is, uh, I have one with a crank on it <clears> that <throat> charges the batteries with a crank. Nicest thing you'll have in emergencies. Uh, for the family, uh, flashlight, extra batteries, bulbs, generator, fuel, uh, safe operating. Well, extra light bulbs in your flashlight, that's no longer kind of thing we do. We have, everybody probably has LED lights now. Adequate supply of prescription meds on hand, <clears throat> uh, list of emergency phone numbers you got to have. Pet supplies and arrangements, shelters if you uh, don't take the pets, usually in a storm. Uh, they got to go with you or make arrangements for someone to watch them and a list of people to call for assistance, maps and emergency escape routes, a way to contact each other and a plan for reuniting later. You got to have all that in place before you do anything. That's stuff to think about now and not when it's in your vehicle warm clothes in the trunk, chains in the trunk, fuel and gas, fuel and gas take, uh, sand shovel and take and sand and shovel in the trunk, window ice scrapers, uh, flares, flashlights, antifreeze, uh, familiarity with school and daycare plans, um, alternative shelter plans, alternative transportation arrangements, identified snow routes and bus timetables. Of course, you pick from the list what affects you at, at that moment. <clears throat> Should you really leave? There are times when your family may need you as much or more than the MCOM group does. And like I said, family comes first. Uh, so if there's any doubt, your decision must be to stay with your family. You should discuss and come to an agreement with your spouse well before any disaster in order to avoid any last minute problems and alternatively, have your spouse get an amateur radio license and a company on the deployment. Leave the kids at home, they'll be okay. Now I don't know if, if you don't have kids, that's a pretty cool idea too. <clears throat> you are first, the mission is second. You will need to continue to take care of yourself. If you become overly tired and ill or weak and you can't do your job properly, that's not a good thing. Uh, if you do not take care of personal cleanliness, you can become an unpleasant person to be around. And whenever possible, each station should have at least two operators on duty so that one can take a break for sleep, food, and personal hygiene. If that is not possible, work out a schedule with the MCOM managers or your NCS in that control station to take periodic off-duty breaks. <clears throat> safety is everybody's responsibility. Personal safety everybody, uh, is responsible for your own safety. No petitions. Do not undertake any activity for which you feel it's unsafe 
or violates this policy, uh, policy uh, do not hesitate to ask for uh, help or advice from others. <clears throat> At the safety briefings, all personnel are required to attend and contribute to the safety briefings. I used to wonder why they were important until you really needed to know. Then I get it. Uh, personal awareness, everyone is responsible for reading and understanding the safety and policy and carrying out their duties in compliance with this policy way, uh, guides, guidelines. Uh, safety issues, everyone's responsible for the safety of the operation. If you see something that violates the provisions of the safety policy, you are obligated to call the attention of the safety officer or the incident commander. If you see something that's not right, speak up because if anybody gets injured or anything, it messes up the whole, whole thing. In the event that the incident commander or the safety officer is not available, each, addition, each individual is authorized to hold operations which violate these guidelines. Now, <clears throat> in having said all that, make sure that uh, if it can be corrected quickly, do it. You don't wanna have to stop things if you really don't have to. And I say that because some people can go overboard. And uh, you know, I'm gonna use a, a, a something that happened recently. One of the DJs went into uh, to, to set up a job for us and he pointed out that the electrical outlet had a cracked um, cover. He said, that must be repaired before we can continue. <clears throat> I said, uh, sure, we'll get on that next week. So it wasn't our property. It was, we were guests in someone else's property. It's their problem. Work around it, find another place to plug it in. That's the kind of way it can go overboard sometimes. <clears throat> uh, general safety checklist, a safety officer assigned to all field operations. A contact list including local fire police and security is maintained by the safety officer. All field operations have a plan and all personnel know their job assignments and understand the plan. And the crew is adequate for the job, no less than you need or no more than you need is necessary. And a crew with specific first aid and CPR training is identified by the safety officer. Like I said, I don't feel comfortable giving CPR unless it's, there's no one else to do it. Then you got to do it. Um, food is something we don't often think about when we go out, even for drills, but it's important. Most people need 2000 calories a day, which which is two of those cookies they have over cheats that are big suckers. They're, anyway, um, they really are. Check them out sometime. Experienced MCOM managers and served agency personnel will usually be aware of this issue and take up steps to see that their volunteers' needs are met. High calorie, high protein snacks will help keep you going, but you also need food that's more substantial. Bring along freeze dried camping food, small pot, camp stove with fuel or some self-heating military style meal ready to eat, some MREs, and boy, are they yummy. <clears throat> and water, you will need at least two or three liters of water each day for drinking, uh, more for other purposes. And the most disaster preparedness checklist suggests that at least one gallon per person a day. And that's what my doctors told me, believe it or not, where'd they get that? Uh, you can get dehydrated water from the military, I think. Many camping supply stores offer a range of water filters and purification tablets that can help make the local water supplies safer. And they, <clears throat> they all have limitations that you should be aware of. Filters may not remove all the potentially harmful organisms or discoloration. Those with smaller filter pores, 0.3 microns, is a very tight filter, will remove more foreign matter, but it will also clog more quickly. Iodine saturated filters will kill or remove most harmful germs and bacteria, but are more expensive 
and impart a faint taste of iodine into the water. Most filters will remove giardia cysts. You don't want them in you. Um, <clears throat> and all water filters require care and are used to avoid cross-contamination surf water with dirty water. Um, I was over at, um, what is it called, Outdoor World <clears throat> today, and they have all that stuff. And uh, apparently it, it's in all the camping places too. So it's worth looking into and having on hand. Yeah, just pictures of the stuff. Get off there. Hold on. He found out what a mirror is. He's young cat. Water purification tablets such as I didn't say it right, Alizone, may have flavors with the type <clears throat> and give the water an unpleasant taste. Tablets do nothing to the particulate or dirt or discoloration in the water. Be sure to read and understand the information that comes with any water purification device or tablet before purchasing or using it. <clears throat> water purification, GFDA says, you can use plain Clorox brand laundry bleach, no perfumes or different taste, whatever, no perfumes. After filtering out the particulate by pouring it through several layers of densely woven cloth, put 16 drops of Clorox in a gallon of water mixed well and allow it to sit for 30 minutes. If it still smells slightly chlorine, you can use it. If not, stir in 16 more drops and wait another half hour. <clears throat> um, if it still does not smell like chlorine, discard the water and find a new supply. So it will not taste great, nor will the chlorine bleach kill cysts like Giardia, but it may be enough. 16 drops, about an eighth of a teaspoon. And the last resort, if you have no other means of boiling for at least five minutes, will kill any bacteria and other organisms who will not remove and kill it and or discoloration. Boiling will leave the water with a flat taste and can improve, be improved by pouring it back and forth between two containers several times to reintroduce some oxygen. Uh, and of course, there's the solar uh, plastic sheet suspended across an opening with a rock to hold it down and a container to catch the, uh, the distilled water. That's, a, that's another one of those survivalist things that some of us know about. Sleep is important. Get at least six continuous hours of sleep, a 24 hour period, um, or four continuous hours over shorter naps. Uh, soft foam earplugs and black eye masks to ensure that light and noise around you are not a problem. Uh, all that stuff's available at Walmart. Uh, I just picked up uh, a lot of that earplug stuff for uh, target shooting. You have it all. Uh, personal handles, toothbrush, comb, deodorant. If possible, bring a bar of soap or waterless hand cleaner, small towel, washcloth, a few extra shirts. Why a bar of soap? Because that's easier to transport than the uh, big bottles of stuff that most people use now. Safety in an unsafe situation. Now, natural disasters can bring flying and falling debris, <clears throat> high or fast moving water, <clears throat> fire explosions, building collapse, uh, polluted water disease, toxic chemicals, a variety of other dangers. And you should always be aware of your surroundings and the dangers that are harbored in those areas. Uh, depending on whether your gear might include hard hat, rain gear, warm non-cotton layers, uh, work gloves, waterproof boots, why not in cotton? Uh, always bring several pairs of non-cotton socks and change them often to keep your feet dry. And create seasonal clothing lists suitable for your climate 
uh, types of disasters you might encounter. And there's, cotton tends to hold moisture. That's why they're saying non-cotton layer. <clears throat> That's um, Under Armour is good for that. Sturdy footwear. Um, <clears throat> I can't stress that one enough. You need to have decent footwear. Um, uh, if you're not uh, wearing good shoes, your legs will give out, start hurting and all that. Safety glasses and goggles used when cutting wire, soldering, working around machinery, different things that you might need them for. Uh, respirators, dust masks, bandanas available at fires, floods, and earthquakes, you gotta have them. Uh, OSHA approved hard hats are worn by all ground crew and for tower erection operations. No exceptions. Climbing helmets are worn during climbing operations. Uh, that one, from experience, you need a helmet when you're climbing. <laughs> you definitely do. Uh, those glasses, uh, uh, I get them over at Tractor Supply. I would imagine Walmart would have them too. Avoid dangerous areas. Industrial buildings, facilities may contain toxic chemicals, which can be released in a disaster, like hospitals. Uh, a lot dams can break, bridges can wash out, buildings can collapse. Areas can become inaccessible due to flooding, landslides, collapsed structures, advancing fires and storms and surges. You can avoid being in harm's way. Uh, do it if you can. And you can also prevent yourself from becoming part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Um, and you think about, well, how can bridges and all that wash out? But uh, they do. Uh, in 1972, my dad was one of the first on the scenes of a bridge washed out. And they, were, they had to get people who were clinging to trees out of that swift moving water. Uh, so it, it can come up anywhere. If you're trapped or isolated, be prepared to help others find or rescue you. How do you do that? Let others know where you are going to going if you must travel anywhere, even within a safe building. Try, try not to travel alone in dangerous conditions. Bring a buddy. Uh, signaling devices, you know, like the, the breakaway uh, sticks, uh, light sticks, flashlights, uh, whistles, all kinds of things can be used <coughs> to signal <clears throat> and uh, let people know where you are. And let, I don't know if you guys watched a lot of TV. There, there's a TV show called uh, The Good Doctor. A couple of seasons ago, maybe last season, I don't know. They, they were trapped in an earthquake in a building and they used all those things to signal to get people in to where they needed them. Uh, all those things listed, the, the breakaway lights, uh, flashlights and whistles and stuff. In most cases, you will not need your own shelter for operating and sleeping. You may be able to stay at work in the emergency operations center, evacuation shelter, or even in your own vehicle. In some cases, a tent, camp trailer, motor home, or other suitable shelter may be necessary. Um, I don't know how many of you are outdoors people. I have, I have my share of tents that I use and uh, for all kinds of reasons, and you can take that kind of stuff with you. Uh, pick a tent equipped to withstand the harshest conditions you might encounter, rated for high winds, <clears throat> waterproof, full coverage, rain fly on it, waterproof bottom, um, use brown cloth or footprint to extend the life of the tent's floor so you don't punch holes in it. <clears throat> but tents are cheap these days, comparatively, at a Walmart near you. Uh, medical considerations discuss any medical conditions with your physician ahead of time, potentially that would interfere with your ability to do your job. If you're diabetic, of course, you need to avoid going for long periods without proper food or medications. Stress can affect your blood sugar level. <clears throat> and your heart you may need to avoid stress situations if you have heart issues. If you ha have an adequate supply of appropriate meds on hand, 
have a copy of any prescriptions. Well, nowadays the pharmacies all have them and they can interchange them. <clears throat> but it doesn't hurt to have your prescription numbers and all that with you. Let your MCOM and any work partners know of your conditions so that they can take appropriate action if something goes wrong. <clears throat> Keep a copy of any special medical information, emergency numbers in your wallet at all time. A couple of ways you can do that. Well, I, I have a, I have one of these. I have, it's a, it broke off the necklace. Yeah, I have one of these uh, medical alert jobbers, and um, that tells the medical people a lot of information when they need it. Uh, but keep all your your information with you. You can even carry it on a thumb drive. Label the thumb drive as medical information, and wear an ID, medical ID, if you have one, like like I just showed you there. Protect your Inside. If you wear glasses, at least one spare pair, because you never know when that's going to happen. You need them. Contact lenses bring more than enough changes to avoid out. You may want to switch to glasses to avoid having to deal with lens removal and cleaning under field conditions. Since this was written, <clears throat> uh, you can get the contacts like I use. I wear reader glasses because of the needing them, but the contacts take care of everything at a distance. I don't take them out for two or three months at a time. It's a special kind that they have now. So if you're wearing contacts and you don't like taking them out and putting them back in, you can get, get these, you'll love them. If you have any doubts, consult your eye doctor ahead of time, bring a copy of your lens prescription along. It may be a good idea, especially if you're likely to be gone some distance from home for a while. Sunglasses, they help reduce fatigue, eye damage, and good quality ones have UV blocking, uh, snow blindness. If you're prolonged periods of exposure where the snow, sand can cause retina to be burned. Sunglasses that offer the following are frequently recommended. 99 to 100% UV absorption. Polycarbonate or R C R C R 39 lenses. They're lighter and more comfortable than glass. Uh, five to 10% visible light transmittance. <clears throat> Large lenses that fit close to the face. You're gonna find this and wrap around one shield or one wrap around or side shield to prevent incidental light exposure. <clears throat> You'll find these at a drugstore. They all carry them and they will fit over top of glasses if you wear a prescription glass, they fit right over them. My, I was looking for mine here. They're in my car. That's where I use them the most. Uh, sample personal survival and comfort needs checklist. This is, again, these are just examples. You choose from these lists what affects you most. Suitable size backpack or duffel bag for clothing and personal gear. I have, they have all kind of them now. Uh, they have them that are insulated and can also be parts of them can be a refrigerated area to keep your food in, in those backpacks and duffel bags. I have backpacks that have that. Uh, we hike and uh, it's good to carry extra food when you're doing that too. A uh, plastic storage tub for food and cooking gear, a toilet kit, soap, comb, deodorant, shampoo, toothbrush, toothpaste, Toilet paper in a zipper locked freezer bag. Don't carry it any other way. A small towel and washcloth, lip balm, facial tissues, sunscreen, insect repellent, uh, prescription meds, uh, one week supply, copies of medical and eyeglass contact lens prescriptions, spare eyeglasses and contact lenses supplies, hand lotion for dry skin, small first aid kit, Non-prescription meds, including painkiller, antacids, and anti-diarrheal, and so forth, are good things to have. Um, <clears throat> continued. Extra basic clothing: shirts, socks, underwear, gloves for protection from for or warmth, pocket flashlights, folding pocket knife, sleeping bag, closed cell phone pad, air mattress, pillow, earplugs. 
the soft foam pipe or uh, make sure that uh, the foam types make sure they're sealed in a pla in a package because you don't want to be sticking crud and dirt in your ears. <clears throat> a sleeping bag, closed cell phone pad or air mattress and a pillow, earplugs, uh, black eye mask if you want to sleep and it's bright outside, outer clothing for the season and conditions, rain, gear, parka, hat, face, mask, and so forth. Hard hat, reflective vest, hat. By the way, those reflective vests are a good deal at uh, ARRL. And they have amateur radio written on them, amateur radio communications. Travel alarm clock. I use my cell phone for that. I'm sure you all do too. Uh, chemical light sticks, police whistle, a signal whistle, dust mask. Uh, all the contact information for your family and friends and neighbors and all that. <clears throat> uh, emergency contact information card in your wallet, spare car and house keys, high energy or high protein snacks, and freeze dried or MREs. Um, consider packing individual items or kits in zipper lock freezer bags to keep the contacts dry, clean, and neat. I use Ziploc bags for everything. Everything goes into one and it's labeled. Um, even down to the wiring and everything that I use to hook up radios and all the stuff for programming them. They go into a Ziploc bag and get labeled. Uh, plate or bowl, knife, uh, spoon, all that, camp stove, small pot, matches, battery, uh, or other lantern, water in heavy plastic jugs. Don't want something that's going to break. Water purification of tablets, magnetic compass maps, duct tape, parachute cord, and that's it for this section. <clears throat> Any comments before we go on? <clears throat> okay, and then this will be the last one for today. Um, <clears throat> which of the following statement is true about water purification? Purification tablets will remove the bacteria and particulate matter. Which of the following statements? Oh, it's false. <laughs> yeah, it's not true. Purification tablets don't remove, they kill it, and they don't remove particulate matter. Which of the following is true about using unscented household chlorine to purify water? It's best to use an eighth of a teaspoon of plain chlorine bleach, bleach per gallon of water. <clears throat> Which of the following is true about personal gear you bring for a long-term incident? Who is keep a spare eyeglasses or safety glasses, goggles in a hard, sh in a hard shell felt line storage case. Why felt line? You don't want them getting scratched up. Many disaster assignments are in unsafe places. Which of the following is true about such locations? <clears throat> Always plan more than one escape route from buildings in any hazardous area. Which of the following statements about safety and survival is true? The answer to this one is your personal safety and well being are a higher priority than the mission. <clears throat> a lot of people want to be a uh, hero and they forget about that kind of safety and no time for heroes. Okay. What? Okay. We're going to pick it up on 23 next time. <clears throat> uh, but actually on the next one, what I'd like to do is <clears throat> we're going to take a break from this course <clears throat> and cover some of the basic ham radio things that we take for granted sometimes and um, and uh, as, as experienced operators and maybe want to get some a little clearer idea on how some of this stuff works. <clears throat>